Hey everyone, I'm so sorry. I thought y'all were staging a mutiny. I've been in my 241 class, which meets on Mondays and Wednesdays for the last 10 minutes. And I'm like, where are my students at? Are they are they all upset with me? <laughs> Just looked up and realized the folder said it was 241, not 242. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> That's what I get for trying to do like three different canvas pages at the same time. My dog's going to be very helpful. I can feel it already. Anywho, anybody have any questions before we get started? I know it's already past time to start. Uh, we're going now. We've completed uh, chapters 21 and 22. We're going into chapter 23. Uh, I will do some stuff today to introduce you to the concepts of 23, so you can certainly start your homeworks for chapter 23, uh, but we will finish them next time and maybe even go ahead and start jumping into uh, chapter 24. So, any questions about any previous work, topics, anything of that sort? All right, so the big idea here, it seems like no one has any questions, not via chat or actually uh, in terms of actually talking. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce what we're going over. So we'll be going over chapter 23 today, parts of it, and it's called electric potential. So when we studied Newton's laws of motion, we first, of course, covered kinematics, uh, which basically was kinematics in one dimension. And then in chapter three, we went to kinematics in multiple dimensions and we covered, uh, for instance, uh, projectile motion. And that required us, since it was multiple dimensions, required us to introduce vectors. And then chapter four, we came in and covered uh, Newton's uh, laws of motion, Newton's first, second, and third law, and specifically used a lot of his second law. But his actually, we used a lot of all of them, really. But anyways, that was a vector equation, and we got used to doing that. We worked on... Uh, uh, basically, you know, regular problems where the acceleration was going to be a constant because the total force was a constant. Then we uh, worked on momentum and angular momentum and stuff like that. But ultimately, what we were able to do was find a new way to work problems. And that way did not involve vectors, it involved scalars. Yeah. What we had done was we had com uh, created something sort of equivalent, and that equivalent turned out to be potential energy. So if you have a conservative force, uh, and that has a very specific meaning. Uh, mathematically, it means that something called the curl of the force is identically zero. And the curl is basically you taking that uh, triangle operator, the, the del operator. Uh, also, you've probably seen it as a gradient before. You're taking that gradient operator and doing a cross product of it with the, uh, in, in the case of gravity, we use the gravitational force, G M1, M2 over R squared. Uh, and then in the case of this, we'll do it with the electric field because the electric field turns out just like the force to be a, a conservative force and the curl of that zero. So we could create uh, something equivalent or something like uh, potential energy. And the thing that uh, is like potential energy is called the electric potential. Notice if I say electric potential energy, I am talking about potential energy, the delta U that we talked about uh, in chapter, I think it was 10. I think it was 10. No, that was rotational motion. So it might've been like chapter eight or something like that. Uh, but anyways, uh, when we just say electric potential, then we mean something called V, our voltage, our electric potential, our electromotive force. And just like we took the force, F equals, uh, well, we could use K, K, Q1, Q2 over R squared, R, F equals Q1, Q2 over 4 pi epsilon, not R squared. And we took that force equation and didn't like it. We tried to introduce something that I said was like an aura around one of the charges. And we did so by dividing that electric field, or excuse me, that electric force by Q, the charge that we acted like was feeling the aura. So we imagined one as creating the aura and the other one is feeling the aura. And it was completely arbitrary, which was which. Uh, and since it's arbitrary and since we make the claim that one charge can cause an aura, then all charges must cause an aura. So we had to consider taking the limit 
as Q approached zero of F divided by Q. And that gave us our formula for the electric field, which was basically, let's say, big Q over four pi epsilon, not R squared. Well, in the same sense here, we're going to take the potential energy, which was uh, U, and of course, the change in potential energy, delta U, uh, always the delta means final minus initial. Well, that delta U is going to be uh, related to this electric potential. And to get the electric potential, we're going to take the delta U and divide it by Q. Well, the delta U is the change in potential energy. And, and you know, for instance, one version of potential energy was MGH. So if you actually were to calculate the work done on, let's say, a turtle and lifting it from the ground to a height H and putting it on top of a fence post, say, uh, what you would find out is the work done would be M times G times H, where M is the mass of the, her of the turtle and H is the height. Uh, that would be the work you'd have to do on the turtle to move it up to a potential energy of MGH from a potential energy of zero. If you then instead calculated the work done by gravity, you would get negative MGH. And uh, we're going to do the same thing. And we're going to say the potential, the electric potential uh, is the electric potential energy delta U divided by Q. And delta U is going to be the negative of the work done by the electric field. So let me go ahead and show you that. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right here. I've got it written up already just to make it clear and you'll have uh, some nice symbols. You'll have nice boxed off areas on the notes. So you can see exactly what's going on. And I'm introducing sort of three concepts right now. Now, I'm going to try again to stop yawning. That's probably zero chance, but all right. So there's my sort of opening statement or opening definition, if you will. I'm going to say, I'm saying there is a quantity delta V that is the change. That's the change in electric potential. So notice, notice I'm saying electric potential. I did not use the word energy on the end. If I use the word energy, that refers to potential energy. And that is, of course, a thing that's measured in joules. This quantity right here is the change in potential energy. And you can call it electric potential energy, and that's fine too, because it is actually caused by uh, the electric uh, force. Uh, but generally speaking, we just call it potential energy. But just like we took F and divided it by Q to get E, we're taking delta U and dividing it by Q to get V. Now, as I was saying, this delta U, the change in potential energy, like all deltas are supposed to be, is the final U minus the initial U. That's why you see UB minus UA, because it looks like A would obviously be the first and B would be the second uh, or final position. And I did the same thing with the VB and the VA over there. But what I'm saying in the next line is that it's equal to the negative of the work done by the electric force. So this one right here is uh, work done by the electric force. So that's why the negative is there, just like uh, in doing the work of, of by gravity of picking the uh, turtle up and putting it on top of the fence post, that would be a negative MGH, whereas the change of potential energy would be a positive MGH. So that's why that negative is there. And then I'll further take and just call it one over Q times negative one, because that's negative is already there. And the one over Q is the same thing as division by Q. And the formula for work is F dot DL, taking the integral of that, 
of course, if you multiply it by one over Q, you get the F becoming E. So it's actually equal to the negative integral of E dot DL, which is what I'm showing here with this formula. So that's the formula you're going to consistently use to calculate a change in voltage. Okay. So a change in electric potential. So that's electric potential. It's also called voltage. And it's also called electromotive force. But again, that's somewhat of a misnomer because it does not have units of force. It has units of volts. So what is the volt? Well, uh, V has units, you can see, of joules divided by coulomb, and that is defined to be the volt. Okay, so, which is abbreviated just plain V. So that's the actual unit of the electromotive force. That's the unit of the voltage. That's the unit of the electric potential. Whereas the unit of U, the potential energy, was just joules. Okay. Now, uh, by looking at that very top formula, the one with no boxes around it, but with all the words explaining stuff, we can see that ultimately delta U is equal to Q times delta V. So that's an important equation. And basically it says, hey, if you want to know the change in electric potential energy, all you have to do is multiply the change in electric potential by the charge. And this is one of the few times you actually uh, often use the charge, uh, the sign of the charge. One of the times it is common to use the sign. Okay. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to, but I'm just saying uh, a lot of times people will use it there so you can get some understanding. I'll show you that in a second. Whereas like when we used F equals Q1, Q2 over four pi epsilon, not R squared, we did not use the sign of the charge. When we used E, the electric field is equal to Q over four pi epsilon, not R squared. We again did not use uh, the charge. But I'm also going to have a Coulomb's law version of the electric potential. And that electric potential is going to be another case where we absolutely do use the sign. Uh, so that's something that you've got to wrap your head around. So that explains that first boxed off equation. We've sort of given you an explanation of the second box off equation, or excuse me, the third box off equation. I should probably put A and B up here for the range of integration, just so you understand that I'm literally talking about going from position A to position B. Uh, now that middle box, that is actually a new unit that we find is super, super, super helpful when we're dealing with atoms, uh, molecules, also when we're dealing with uh, electrons, protons, neutrons, those sort of things. Uh, and it's called the electron volt, and it's defined to be the potential energy uh, that's achieved by an electron or a proton going through an uh, electric potential difference of one volt. So you can see, because the formula is Q times delta V, it would be 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs for a proton, say, times 1.000 to any number of zeros volts. Uh, of course, the 1.602 is only four sig figs. So that gives you 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. Remember, a, a volt is a joule per coulomb. So when you multiply it by a coulomb, you get a joule. And that's defined to be 1.000 electron volts. If I wanted it to have more zeros, I'd have to ex uh, express more sig figs in the charge of the proton. So uh, we've now covered that as well. Everybody understand what I'm talking about as far as that goes? Anybody have any questions on that? Okay, so the reason I'm bringing this up is, of course, we're studying now voltage. This voltage, this electric potential, this EMF, this electromotive force. Oh, that's another one I should put up there. 
E M F. That's another uh, thing that we call it. So EMF is another one. So this thing is something that we can use. Uh, if you look through, for instance, uh, chapter 23, you'll see them talking about the same stuff I did. You'll see a lot of these same equations. In fact, uh, these equations are actually labeled and have numbers so you can use them. Uh, I've, of course, included them as well. Uh, they also add another version, which is also correct. So I'll just write it down here for completeness. And I'll say that basically the voltage or the electric potential at A is equal to the electric potential energy at A divided by Q. So that's another formula that you might use from time to time. But you can see it's really just a, a single incident of the delta V equation that I wrote up top. In other words, we're just considering a, a particular spot A or a particular spot V. Uh, so that's all that's about. Uh, it says, note that the electric potential, like the electric field, does not depend on our test charge Q. V depends on the other charges that create the field, not the test charge Q. Q acquires potential energy by being in the potential V due to the other charges. So that's sort of the, the big picture that we're getting there. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, solve a specific problem uh, so we can have uh, uh, some sense of what we're talking about here uh, of how to use these. So let's do an example. So my example uh, is going to be, suppose you have an electron, uh, it's going to be sitting in a potential difference, let's say, uh, an electron is near the negative plate of a capacitor. We've talked about capacitors, though I haven't actually studied capacitance yet with you guys, but a capacitor, uh, the simplest form is two big flat plates very close to each other. One has a positive charge, the other one has a negative charge. The magnitudes of the charges are exactly the same, and they're separated by a small distance. The bigger the area of the plates are, the smaller the distance between them, the bigger the capacitance is. And the voltage across them turns out to just be the electric field, which is a constant times the distance D. So that gives you sort of all the background information you need. So imagine an electron is near the, the negative plate of a capacitor. And uh, let's say that has a delta V which we're going to say is uh, the final position VB minus the initial position VA is equal to positive 5,000 volts. Uh, what we would like to know is A, what is the change in potential energy? What is the electrons? delta u if it goes from next to the next to the negative plate to right next to the positive plate. So that's one question. And the other question is, uh, how fast will it be going? Okay. So we can imagine the picture like this. I want to draw it so y'all can so I can ask you some questions. So here's a negative plate. And then here's a positive plate. So 
So can uh, anyone answer me this? We're going to imagine the electron is right there, right next to the negative plate. And this is position A. And it's going to go right here to position B. Does that look like the the place that the elect or does that look like what the electron would do on its own or does this look like something we'd have to force the electron to do that's the question i'm asking anyone uh let me put up my chat box just in case somebody's typing the answer i think it needs to be forced you think it's going to need to be forced? Uh, I will. Uh, I will tell you that I haven't necessarily given you everything you need to know uh, to to make the right answer. Uh, but I will remind you that there is something you have that you can put it together with. Uh, do light charges repel or attract? Repel. Right. And when I say the left plate is negative, that means it's literally like it's a plate that has a bunch of negative charges, sort of as if they're glued to the outer surface. So we've got a butt ton of negative charges and then a negative electron right next to it. Does that feel like that electron is comfortable? So that was what I was trying uh, to get you guys to see. Uh, yes, it would be much more comfortable if the negative charge were next to the positive charges because they're unlike and they attract. So it will actually not require a force. In fact, this is what it's going to do on its own. And what we know of historically from the previous uh, semester 241 is that in general, things move in such a way that they decrease their potential energy. So that's what we're trying to figure out is uh, in part one, we want to know what's the change in potential energy delta U. So I, I want to show you physically what's going on here. And to do so, I'm going to draw a voltmeter or multimeter. Okay. And I'm going to put the dial right here. And that dial is going to be on V dot 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 like that. So that's DC voltage. Uh, there is going to be, I'll change up the order just because it makes it easier to write. I'm going to say that this, actually, let's do this. I'm going to say that this port right here is the comm. And I'll say that this port right here is the V. You would recognize it as V omega. So it's supposed to be the positive terminal, in other words. So uh, if you actually connected this with this red wire right here, and then you connected this, say, with this black wire, and remember the color of the wires is just helpful. It doesn't make them physically different than the red wire. But if we connected it like that, like you've done in lab, then this should read 5,000 volts positive. Okay, so that's what I'm telling you is the right-hand side is at positive 5,000 volts, and the left-hand side could be at zero volts if you want. So part A, here's our solution. So for part A, what we're going to do is we're going to use delta U is equal to Q times delta V. Well, that's going to be equal to negative 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th. And I probably should have just wrote it 1.6 because I really don't need that many sig figs, but it's just have it. That's the number I have memorized, so I always say it. And then the change in voltage they gave us was positive 5,000 volts. So the answer is going to be negative and uh the easiest answer would be negative 5,000 electron volts, which equals negative 5.000 kilo electron volts. But that's also the same as 1.602. Oh, let me turn the calculator on. One point six zero two times 10 to the negative 19 times 5,000. 
and that gives me 8.01, negative 8.01 times 10 to the negative 16th joules. So they're, all those answers are technically correct. And that's part A. But I think you can see, and this is sort of the whole reason I did it, is you can see that the easier way is working with electron volts. Okay. So the delta, the change in potential energy is in fact uh, 5,000 kilo, or excuse me, 5,000 electron volts or five kilo electron volts. KEV is another word for it. Uh, this is very much in the realm of x-rays, and it's not an, uh, unlike what the device is that is used in an x-ray, uh, in a radiology facility, for instance. Uh, they actually were, are going to accelerate electrons at voltages on the order of tens of thousands of volts, you know, 5,000 up through maybe 4,000, somewhere around there, and that's how they make them. So now with part B... Uh, I'm going to use the version of conservation of energy that I didn't use when I actually taught it. I usually use uh, U initial plus K initial plus uh, work in is equal to U final plus K final plus work out plus E loss. That's the way I normally do it because it keeps me from having to worry about negative signs. But in this case, it's really uh, kind of neat and convenient to just use delta U plus delta K is equal to zero. So I'm going to do that. Delta U plus delta K, K being kinetic energy, is equal to zero. So that's going to give me uh, negative 8.01 times 10 to the negative 16 joules. I do need to use joules here unless I do some tricks regarding the electron volts, but those tricks you haven't learned yet, so I'm going to leave that. Uh, that plus, now again, delta means final minus initial. Uh, this electron started from rest. Uh, I don't know if I actually stated that. I know I didn't write it, but it did start from rest. So this is going to be one half times the mass of the electron, which is 9.109. I'm just going to write it 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms times V final squared because the one half M V initial squared is zero. So V zero is equal to zero. So with this, we can actually solve for V final. And what I'm going to get is I'm going to take that 18.01 time or 8.01 times 10 to the negative 16th. I pull that to the other side. It'll become positive. And then I'm going to multiply it by two that's going to give me 1.602 times 10 to the negative 15th. And then I'm going to divide it by 9.1 e to the negative 31. And then I'm going to take the square root of that. And right now I'm looking at 1.76 times 10 to the 15th. And I'm going to take the square root of that, which is going to be a really big number. So this is going to be about 4.2. Whoa, Nelly. This is going to be about 4.2 times 10 to the seventh meters per second. Now, that's a little bit bigger than 10% of the speed of light. So, honestly, we should be using relativity at that point, but uh, it's okay. I just wanted to get you used to how to do this. So, anybody have any questions on that? All right, and this also happens to be uh, when you guys have your lab. Actually, you might have already had it because you have your lab on Tuesday. So you did the Faraday lab, and if you remember the glass uh, bulb that you did, that uh, device, it's uh, basically called an E over M tube. That device uses the exact same type of setup as this does. It's got basically two plates, and the plate that the electron is shot through the positive plate actually has a hole in it. And basically the electrons are such high energy that they're popping off the negative plate and being accelerated towards the positive plate. But uh, because of the symmetry, there's no reason for it to go up or down or left or right. It's just going to go straight. And since it goes straight, it's going to go right through that hole. 
and uh, then it's going to go through the air. And of course, then you have the Helmholtz coils that can actually do the magnetism, or you can use your the bar magnet like you did in the Faraday lab, and that'll cause the, the beam to bend. But the, that blue beam that you saw was literally uh, a beam of electrons. Okay, so anybody have any questions on that? Now, my two did not turn out very big there, so I'm getting ready to make it a little bigger just to make sure everybody knows that it was a two. Okay, so any questions on that? Uh, what I wanted to point out is notice uh, I made the argument that the electron was more comfortable moving to the right and getting where it finally was as opposed to where it was in the beginning. If that's the case, like I told you, the change in potential energy uh, should be negative. You should have draw the kinetic energy should have dropped. Or excuse me, the change in potential energy, uh, the change in potential energy should be negative because it should be more comfortable and lower potential energy. And that's exactly what we found. The change in potential energy was a negative number, and that also shows you why I say it's it is common to actually use the sign in the equation delta U equals Q delta V. Anything on that, anyone? All right, your book uh, does give a table of values of voltages just for some perspective. So for instance, if you want to know what the voltage is of a typical thundercloud, in other words, a storm cloud, uh, it's not unlikely or not uh, abnormal for the voltage difference between the ground and the cloud to be 100 million volts. And that's kind of important because it turns out that uh, the atmosphere, the air that we use has a uh, breakdown electric field strength of 3 million volts per meter. So if the, uh, if the cloud was 300 meters above the ground, then you'd need uh, 100 uh, million volts basically. So that gets you roughly what you need to to cause lightning to strike because when lightning strikes, what's going on is the air, which is normally an insulator, is becoming ionized and it takes 3 million volts to ionize one meter of air. So if you have 100 million volts, you can roughly have, uh, well, 100 divided by three, which is about 33. So about 33 meters is uh, the distance 100 million volt cloud could be for it to actually strike. A uh, high voltage power line is 10 to the fifth, maybe 10 to the sixth volts. So that, those are the lines that you see running through uh, country fields on a, a, a big tower that looks sort of like a, a headless, armless person. Those really high up power lines uh, usually run anywhere from, you know, 100,000, 200,000 volts up to one or two million even. And the reason they do that is because it turns out that if you up the voltage, you can decrease the current by the exact same amount. So if you have a power plant that's generating electricity, uh, maybe it generates it at, you know, 120 volts. It's not necessarily reasonable, but we'll just pretend it's 120 volts. Uh, if you if you push that up using what we call as a, a step up transformer, if you step that voltage up from 120 volts to 1.2 million, then that's a factor of 10,000 increase. That factor of 10,000 increase is going to cause the voltage to be 1.2 million because uh, energy is conserved. That means power in must equal power out roughly. So current times voltage has to stay the same. Well, if the voltage went up by a factor of 10,000, then the current must go down by a factor of 10,000. And that's what happens. So the power plant might be supporting, let's say, 10,000 homes. Uh, each home in America generally takes 200 amp service. So you'd be 200 amps times 10,000. That's the number of amps they've got to send from the power plant. So 200 times 10,000, that would be two times 10 to the six. That's 2 million amps. But reducing it by a factor of 10,000 uh, basically makes it down to around 200 amps. And the power lost in delivering that electricity is the current squared divided, or excuse, excuse me, the current squared times the resistance of the wire. And of course, you can't really change the resistance of the wire. You're going to make it out of probably aluminum because it's cheaper than copper, but still pretty uh, conductive. And it's going to be basically that resistivity of aluminum 
times the length of the wire and then divided by the cross-sectional area of the wire. So you're going to have a fixed uh, R based on how far away it is. That's really it, that and how big the diameter of the wire is. So you end up basically uh, decreasing the power loss by a factor of 10,000 squared because the current went down by a factor of 10,000. So that's that's why those uh, power lines are like that. That's why uh, we step it up to carry that much amperage or excuse me, that, that high of a voltage with the uh, much smaller amperage. Uh, automobile ignition is usually on the order of 10,000 volts. Uh, household outlet, of course, you recognize that. That's about a, a 120 or a 125 volts. They, they say both, but to be honest with you, if you actually take a voltmeter and measure the AC voltage in your light receptacle, you'll see that it bounces around. I often see them around 117 and I see them up around 124. So there is some variance in it. Uh, it's also 60 Hertz for the frequency, by the way. Uh, that varies a little bit, but not nearly as much. Uh, automobile battery, that's 12 volts. Uh, just about all automobile batteries are 12 volts. I will caution you if you go start doing uh, jump starting uh, objects and stuff like that. Uh, there are certain motorcycles that use six volt batteries and certain ones that use 12 volt batteries. So be careful with that. If you go trying to jump a six volt battery with a 12 volt battery, at, like in your car, sometimes that can cause electrical problems. Uh, flashlight, uh, AAA, AA batteries, C batteries, D batteries, they're all 1.5 volts. Of course, a nine volt battery is nine volt. Then you can sell uh, six volts and 12 volt batteries as well. Uh, nerve membranes are about a tenth of a volt and potential changes on the skin are one ten thousandth. So when you're actually doing an EKG or even the the brain readings, uh, the I forget what they call those. Uh, it's not an EKG or ECG, it's some other term, uh, but those are on the order of 10 to the negative fourth volt. So one ten thousandth of a volt. Any questions on any of that stuff? All right, so I need to talk to you a little bit about that little formula. As I told you, uh, VB minus VA is equal to negative integral of E dot DL, okay? This is called a line or path integral. This is another topic. We've already talked about it. If you had me for 241, when we did work, we were actually doing line integrals in. They're called line or path integrals. And that's a branch or that's a part of mathematics called vector calculus that is sometimes covered in Calc 3. I've never been to a university that was able to offer that in their Calc 3 course. So I usually say that's the kind of stuff you'd get at, you know, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford, something like that, maybe. I've also discovered that, in fact, a lot of times those schools uh, have so achieved of students, if you will, that sometimes they don't even offer classes like, you know, algebra based physics or or just plain calculus or something like that. So that's sometimes a problem as well. But anyways, the main thing is it's a line integral and it has very specific rules. And uh, what I'm going to tell you is in wording, uh, you've got two choices when you go to decide your range of integration and when you go to decide your, your differential line element. Uh, you're actually going to be computing an integral from one place to another. So in this case, you're going to uh, be computing an integral from A to B. Now, uh, that integral needs to reflect that, that direction, and you do so either with the DL or with the range of integration. Whichever one you choose to do is fine, but then the other one has to point in the positive coordinate direction. So let me say that again. When you do a line or a path integral, you have to indicate in the integral process exactly which direction you're going. You can do that by putting uh, the order of the range of integration in the proper order and then putting VL in the positive coordinate direction. or you can put the range of integration in the positive coordinate direction and then put the DL in the direction you're going, not both. The vast majority of the times you do that, you happen to get it right just by happenstance. Okay, so that's the problem with it because you never really get that 
oh, this can actually give me a wrong answer. So I just needed to stress that and I'll show you via examples what we're gonna do. So let's imagine for a second uh, that, okay, yeah, let, let's imagine for a second that we calculate the voltage difference from a positive plate to a negative plate. So let's, let's again look at uh, a parallel plate capacitor. So here's our one plate of our parallel plate capacitor. Now, normally they're a lot bigger and the uh, distance between them is a lot smaller fraction of their size, but I'm just trying to fit it in the paper here. Uh, this side is going to be the positive plate. And this side is going to be the negative plate. And I'm trying to show the same number of negative charges because the real point is this one should have a charge of plus Q and this one's going to have a charge of minus Q. That's the nature of a capacitor. The, the two plates are uh, equally charged in magnitude, but oppositely charged in sign. I'm going to say this distance here, D, is going to be, uh, let's say, 1.00 centimeters. And uh, I am going to... Uh, say that the electric field is pointing this way, which obviously, remember, electric fields are always defined to point in the direction a positive charge would go. A positive charge would run from the left plate towards the right plate, so the electric field points to the right. I'm going to say the electric field is, in fact, uh, 1,000 volts per meter. And now I'm going to calculate the difference in voltage. So what I want to know is I'm going to go from this point here, which is A, to this point here, which is B. And I'm even going to go ahead and imagine a coordinate system where that's my y-axis. And that's my x-axis. And obviously, since I labeled it, so this is D equals 1.00 centimeters. Okay. So the point A is, in fact, 0, 0, and the point B is, in fact, uh, D, 0. So if I wish to calculate this, I'm going to say, uh, what is delta V? for this capacitor. My solution. So again, I probably should call this example. Okay. So uh, the formula that we're using here is delta V which is VB minus VA that shows its final minus initial is equal to the negative integral of E dot DL like that. And as I told you, I've got to uh, choose the coordinate direction or the direction I'm going it, uh, by indicating it with the range of integration or by indicating it with the differential line element. Uh, the other one, whichever one I don't choose, has to be in the positive coordinate direction. So what I'm going to say is delta V is equal to negative integral. Now, the electric field points from left to right, so that's just 1,000 volts per meter, I hat. Okay, that's what the electric field is. And I'm going to use my DL to indicate the direction of integration. So I'm going to say... I'm going from left to right, so the DL is DX I hat. So I'm just specifying here. I chose to indicate direction with the DL, so range of integration must 
be from small x to large x. So now that means I'm going to be from x equals 0 to x equals d, which of course is 1.00 centimeters, which we can also, of course, uh, convert to meters, which we really should. So that's the big rule, okay? So what I'm going to get is 1,000, negative 1,000 volts per meter times the integral from 0 to 1.0 times 10 to the negative 2 meters. In other words, I just converted that to meters. And I pulled the 1,000 out in front because it's a constant. I've got the dx here. And I did use the linearity of the dot product to write the i hats after the fact. And now I've got what looks like my drunken owl. I hat dot I hat is one. That looks like an owl's face to me. But again, I've been messing with Duolingo, so it's probably that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we now have 1,000 volts per meter. And the integral of dx is just x. And then that's going to be 1,000 volts per meter times 1.00 times 10 to the negative 2 meters minus 0 meters. And of course, that gives you a voltage drop of negative 10.0 volts. Okay, so that's the answer. Does that make sense to everyone? Now I'm going to show you in the lab setting what this means. So again, I'm going to draw a multimeter. Let's draw our multimeter like this. Okay, uh, and actually, I drew. I was going to put that multimeter somewhere else, so I didn't do a good idea, a good job with where I decided to put that. So I'm going to do it like this. Now I'm going to have my reading right here. I'm going to have uh, my dial right here. It's going to point to V like that. So that says I'm actually on DC. I'm going to have uh, my com be right here. And I'm going to have my V Omega port right here. Uh, what I need to do is I need to find the final voltage minus the initial voltage. So uh, what I really want to do is connect this red line to the, that plate and then connect this black line to that plate. And then that is going to read negative 10.0 volts. So that's what that uh, determination, that calculation just showed us. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions on that? All right, now, Hopefully you felt like I'm making crap up when I suggested it's important that you do that rule about the signs. And uh, I'm going to make that further seem like the case <laughs> because now I'm going to show you the other way around. So let's do this one. Uh, alternate. And hopefully by seeing this, you'll understand the difference between the two ways. So delta V is equal to the negative integral uh, of E dot DL, which is 1,000 volts per meter I hat dotted with DL. So this time I choose to use the range 
of integration. Oops. to indicate direction. So DL must point in positive coordinate direction. Okay, well, guess what that means? That means I'm going to integrate from x equals 0 to uh, 1.00. Zero zero. I read that really small. Times 10 to the negative 2 meters. And then, of course, d L is going to be dx i hat because that happens to be in the positive direction. So you're literally doing the exact same integral. So again, I'm just going to get negative 10.0 volts. Okay. That's the fact that that came out to be exactly the same is the reason why I told you that uh, you can do these integrals, you know, more or less for four years in an engineering or science program and still not get that. Uh, that there's a potential pitfall here because a lot of times you're just going to be integrating in the right direction. So it doesn't matter if you happen to be integrating in the same in the positive coordinate direction, then it all just works out. So uh, if I were to instead integrate in uh, in that same system, uh, but go from B to A, then you would see the complication. So let's do that. Now let's say uh, compute. V A minus V B is equal to delta V for cat above. Okay, here's my solution. Delta V, which equals V A minus V B, is equal to the negative integral of e dot dl and uh i am going to choose this time to use the range of integration so i'm going to go from x equals 1.00 centimeters to zero and then this is going to be 1000 volts per meter i hat dotted with now I've got to use the dx pointing in the positive coordinate direction so it's going to have to the dl so that's going to have to be dx i hat and I'll put a little note I chose to indicate direction with range of integration. Okay, I just used an acronym that I just made up. Okay. So you can see with this one, you're going to get again, negative 1000 dx, uh, the integral of dx is just going to be x. So you end up getting zero minus one, and then that's times a negative one. So you're going to get, in fact, oops, you're going to get, in fact, positive 10.0 volts. You can also see, here's the alternative. Uh, delta V is equal to VA minus VB is equal to the negative integral. Uh, 
This time I'm going to go from 0 to 1.00 centimeters, 1,000 volts per meter I hat dotted with now I'm going to use the range or the uh, differential line element to indicate the direction. So the direction I'm actually going is in the negative x direction. So I'm going to write dx i hat like that. Okay. So that's going to give me positive 1000 volts per meter times the integral from 0 to 1.00 centimeters of dx. Okay. And you see that this, in fact, equals positive 10.0 volts again, because I had to convert, of course, the uh, the centimeters to meters. Oh, crap. So notice I got the same answer, but I did it two different ways. Uh, indicate direction. So does that make sense to everyone? To some extent, I know it's kind of abstract and weird, uh, but the main thing is you just need to know how to be able to do that in the event that such a problem comes up. So any questions? All right. Well, next what I'm going to do is I am going to... Uh, I'm going to actually figure out what the voltage is for a charge conducting sphere. Uh, I'm going to start off by drawing a coordinate system because the coordinate systems make me feel comfortable. <laughs> so let me draw, actually, let me first draw the circle because that makes it a little easier to, to do. So I'm going to draw a circle. That looks like a pretty good circle to me. Now I'm going to draw a coordinate system that I'm going to attempt to uh, put right at the origin at the center of the sphere. Now I drew a circle, but it's actually a sphere, don't forget. So this, this axis is going to be my x-axis. This axis, I'm going to imagine going really, really far away. And that's going to be my y-axis. And this axis up here is going to be my z-axis. And I'm going to say this sphere has a radius that I'm going to call big R. Okay. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is say, uh, consider a charge conducting sphere. of radius R. Compute the voltage, actually I need to say a different word, the electric potential, potential everywhere. Okay, so that's the problem we're trying to solve. Now, one thing I want to remind you that is that uh, hopefully you've been reading your book and it's told you that in what we call electrostatics, the electric field inside of a conductor is always zero. So in electrostatics, the electric field in any conductor is zero, okay? Electrostatics, you can sort of think of that as uh, whenever I don't have charges moving. In fact, like when you first bring a charge near a sphere, uh, a conducting sphere, when you first bring it nearby, there's charges moving everywhere because all the charges that are free to move in the conducting sphere are trying to get away from the charge that you brought near it. If it's the same charge, 
or it's trying to move towards it if it's the opposite charge, the opposite sign. Uh, at during that period where all that things, all those things are moving, that's not an electrostatic situation. But once weak equilibrium is established, everything stops moving. That's electrostatics again. So because of that, we can use Gauss's law. for a conducting sphere. Now, this is something you should already know, but I'm not, a, I'm not sure that you do. So I'm, I'm taking the time to interrupt this problem to do it, but I just wanted to make sure you understood why I was doing what I was doing. So let me draw the sphere for you again. Okay, so this is the actual sphere. something like that. Uh, evidently, this thing does not draw ellipses very well, so I'm just going to leave it like that. So uh, according to Gauss's law, the closed, whoa, well, nearly, it also does not draw closed integrals. So the closed integral of E dot dA, i.e. the electric flux through the closed surface, is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. So let me choose a very specific Gaussian surface. I'm going to take a spherical, oh, it looks like I can't do it that way. So I'm going to pull off the tool that, that makes it nice. I, I'm going to choose a Gaussian sphere just inside of the surface of this sphere. So it's, it's another sphere, but it's just barely inside. Okay. So we have this sphere, the blue one, that looks like this and then we have the red one uh, that's just inside of it so we know since e equals zero for electrostatics then the closed integral of e dot da is equal to zero well, that implies that Q enclosed is equal to zero. So that tells us, in fact, that all of the charge must be on the outside edges of the sphere. So that's the nature of a conductor. In an electrostatic situation, any charge you put on a conductor is going to remain on the outside edges of it. Okay? Okay. So that's important because I need to understand that. And it's also important because uh, if I did a plot, for instance, of electric field for this particular guy, uh, for this particular sphere, it would look something like this. Uh, let's say this is R, this is E, uh, this is capital R, and in fact, at capital R, the electric field would be Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared, like that. And then it would fall off like 1 over R squared. Okay. But then at that point, it would drop straight down to zero and be zero all the way here like this. So that's the actual electric field. Uh, of this situation and that that's going to come in handy now what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the the voltage at all points so first off I'm going to say for y equals r that's greater than r because uh, the symmetry of the sphere notice I could rotate that sphere about the z-axis by any angle I want that would cause the y-axis to move if the uh, uh, if the axis is actually attached to the sphere. But if it's not, it would just sit perfectly still, and then a new direction would be the y direction. In both cases, what you see is the direction of y is arbitrary. So I, me putting that y-axis could have been anywhere, and therefore, if I just integrate along the y-axis, I'm doing a perfectly general problem because the spherical symmetry uh, indicates that any direction would be, you know, basically arbitrary. So that's what I'm actually going to do. 
uh, and I'm going to integrate it from R equals infinity because I would imagine if you have a charge Q out at a radius R from the origin, if I go infinitely far away, I would expect the electric potential to be zero. Does that make sense? So uh, I expect V approaches zero as r approaches infinity so uh delta v which equals v of r minus the limit its final mass initial mass the limit as r approaches infinity of v of r is equal to the negative integral of e dot dl like that Okay, now the electric field, hopefully you recall from Gauss's law, or excuse me, from Coulomb's law, that the electric field for a charge Q that's spherically symmetric is the same as the electric field for a point charge Q at the origin. Uh, and therefore it's just Q over four pi epsilon, not R squared. And it points radially outward, which in this case looks just like uh, the J hat direction. So I'm going to write integral of Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared. Now that is uh, going to be in the R hat direction. Of course, since I'm doing it along the Y axis, I could call it J hat. doesn't matter. Uh, but I'm using the R hat so it still looks uh, arbitrary. And then I'm going to choose my differential line element that you to to indicate direction so here's a case where we're going to see it in action i'm going to say we're going in the opposite of the r direction so i'm going to call this negative dr r hat that means my range of integration has to be from a uh, small number to large number well the small number is r and the large number is infinity okay So I'll just write here, indicates direction. Of integration. Okay, so we're actually getting to see another one in action. These two negatives are going to make, of course, a positive. So I'm going to say equals the integral from R to infinity of uh, Q over 4 pi epsilon naught dr over R squared R hat dot R hat, which in this case is just 1, okay? Uh, this becomes Q over 4 pi epsilon naught. The integral of R to the negative 2 is negative one over r to the negative one. So I'm going to take the limit as r approaches infinity of, I'll put the negative up here, it'll be one over r minus just one over r. So this part right here is the uh, limit as r approaches infinity. In case you haven't learned that in your calculus class, basically that's the way you handle an integration of infinity. Okay, so can anybody tell me what the integral, or excuse me, what the limit of 1 over R is as R approaches infinity? Zero. Yep, so that's zero. So you end up getting a negative times a negative, and the answer is U over 4 pi epsilon 9 R. And remember, since that was delta V, excuse me, I, I should probably do it a different way. Since that was delta V, we have uh, V of R minus zero is equal to delta V, which equals Q over four pi epsilon not R. That means V of R is equal to Q over four pi epsilon not R. Okay. 
for r equals r, this becomes v of r is equal to q over 4 pi epsilon naught big R. So there's another part of the answer for us. And now delta V, so I'm working the last part, delta V is equal to V of R less than R minus V of R like that. That's going to be the negative integral of E dot DL. Okay. Well, from what we just learned about Gauss's law, we know that this is going to be equal to the negative integral of zero dot DL. So it's actually going to be zero, which means that V, ooh, which means that, dang it, stop doing that which means that V of R or R less than big R is just going to be equal to V of R. So if I were to actually compute this, I would say uh, on this graph, I'm also gonna graph V and V is going to look like this because it's one over R as opposed to one over R squared, it's a little higher. And then it gets here and just levels off. And in fact, this quantity is Q over four pi epsilon naught R. Okay. And this falls off like one over R instead of one over R squared. All right. That's... That's it for that one. And I want to express to you that that formula, let's put a star by it. It's super helpful. So here's a wonderful star. Here's another wonderful star. And here's another wonderful star. Okay, that formula is actually correct. If you have a spherical distribution of, of charge Q at the origin, then the voltage due to that will be Q over four pi epsilon not R. This is in fact another Coulomb law, a uh, Coulomb's law. So at least I call it that. Uh, so I'd say this is Coulomb's law for V. Okay. So we can use that formula just like we used E is equal to Q over four pi epsilon not R squared. And then of course that was a vector quantity. So we had all those sentences to tell us about what direction it pointed. And we can use it just like we used F is equal to Q1, Q2 over four pi epsilon not R squared with all those sentences about direction as well. But this one is a scalar quantity, so it's a lot easier. Uh, let's do, I've got about, seven minutes left. I'm going to use that now to show you a, another thing that we can do. So let's look, for instance, at our, uh, let's look at the dipole that we uh, studied before. So I'm going to draw a coordinate axis again. Uh, and that was supposed to be straight lines, but I'm going to ignore it. So that's going to be an X. That's going to be a Y. I'm going to say right here is a is a charge of 50.0 microcoulombs positive. Uh, that's the actual charge. And I'm going to say this position is 3.00 meters. And then I'm going to go over here and say there's a charge of negative 50.0 microcoulombs and this position of course is negative 3.00 meters i'm going to come up here and say this position is 5.0 or excuse me not 5.00 meter i want it 4.00 meters and I'm also going to say, let's call this spot A, and let's call this spot B. And I want to know V at A equals.
equals question mark. That's going to be part A. And then part B, I want to know V at B. Okay. So the solution is going to involve us using that formula V is equal to Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R. And this basically this principle of superposition, which says the, the voltage at A is equal to the voltage at A due to the positive charge plus the voltage at A due to the negative charge. So for part A, I'm going to say V at A is equal to, uh, notice the formula always has a Q, at least the magnitude of the Q, a 4 pi epsilon naught. So I'm going to say 50.0 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs over 4 times pi times 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12th coulomb squared per newton meter squared, like that. Okay, so that's the common factor that all these have. Now, uh, the distance between the positive 50 microcoulombs and point A, you can see that's a 3, 4, 5 triangle. So this one's going to be positive 1 divided by 5.00 meters. And then the negative charge is gonna be the same distance, but that's gonna be a negative one, actually it's plus, and then that'll be a negative one over 5.00 meters. And I think uh, even I can do this arithmetic in my head, the voltage is zero. So notice I did actually put the signs of the charge in. So this is another equation where we definitely put the signs in. Put in signs. Okay, now let's do part B. Again, we're using the same thing, the same formula, but this time, of course, we're doing V at uh, B. So V at B is equal to, again, 50.0 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs over 4 times pi times 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12th coulomb squared per newton meter squared. Uh, by the way, you might have noticed that the units did come out to be volts over there, so I'll go ahead and put that volt in it. Uh, actually... Let me clean that up just a little bit. Okay. So now I've got all the common factors here. But of course, for point B, the distance between the uh, positive charge and point B, I've got to go over six meters and then I got to go up four. So that's going to be positive 1 over the square root of 36.0 meters squared plus 16.0 uh, meters squared. So that got awful mess. Plus 1 over now the, the difficulty with the last one is paid for by the ease of this one. This one's only going to be a distance of 4.00 meters away. And uh, with that, we can do 50e to the negative 6 divided by parentheses 4 times 3.14159 times 8.85e to the negative 12th. That's just the multiplier out in front. So that's 4.50 times 10 to the... Actually, I could say that's 4.500 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times 10 to the 5th. And notice that comes out to be Newton meters squared per coulomb. And then 
36 plus 16 is 52, and the square root of 52 is 7.21. So I'll say 1 divided by 7.211 meters. Plus, actually, this is supposed to be a minus here because that was a negative charge. I don't know why I left off the negative sign there. But uh, I will say I will handle that negative by putting a minus right here. And that will be minus 1 over 4.00 meters. So you see that the you see that the meter in the bottom cancels out one of the meters on top. That leaves a Newton meter on top, which is a joule, and then a joule divided by a coulomb is a volt. So the units do work. So now I'm going to take uh, one divided by that 7.21, and I'm going to subtract from it 0.25, which is what one over four is. And that gives me negative 0.111. So the voltage is actually going to be a negative times uh, 4.500 e to the fifth. And that's going to give me 5.01 times 10 to the fourth volts. And that's it. See how much easier that was than doing the uh, the electric field? for the equal potential, I mean, for the, uh, for the electric dipole. Anybody have any questions on that? All right, that's it. We're done. You guys are free to go. Next time I'll be doing some of the integrations. Uh, there's a formula just like we had for the electric field and for the force that involves integrals. It's basically dV is equal to dQ over 4 pi epsilon naught R, but it's a scalar equation, so that makes life a lot easier. But again, dQ can be lambda dL, or it can be sigma dA, or it can be rho dV, and that's what we're going to do. Okay. I will wait for the last person to leave in case anybody has any questions, but you're all free to go. Thanks for coming, everyone. No questions. Randall, you have anything? All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing this unless Randall needs it. No response, so I'll stop sharing. And that looks like everybody is gone. So have a good one, everybody. Have a nice weekend. Stay safe.